Hello YouTube and welcome to Know Your Ship with me Chase, the series where I go and find as many clips or as many documentaries about a particular ship or a particular class of ships as I can and compile them all into one episode so we can learn something about these wonderful ships that will be in World of Warships when it comes out. So today I'm going to be covering the North Carolina class battleships, of which there were only ever two in existence, the USS North Carolina and the USS Washington. So. Anyways, hopefully you will enjoy this episode, let me know what you think, and if you have suggestions about the next class of ships you would like to see, please leave them in the comment section below and I will try my best to do it. So anyways, enjoy! Battleship North Carolina served most of her wartime experience in the Pacific Campaign as an escort for carrier operations. She served in every major battle and she was there at Tokyo Bay during the uh, signing of the armistice between the United States and Japan. The Battleship North Carolina was the most decorated battleship of World War II. In 1947, the battleship North Carolina was formally decommissioned and put in a layup status by the U.S. Navy. In the late 50s, the Navy determined the ship was in excess and she made her available under a donation contract to the state of North Carolina. In 1961, the battleship North Carolina came to Wilmington, where she serves today as the state of North Carolina's memorial to those who served and those who died during World War II. On July 11, a battleship appears outside Pearl Harbor. She is the USS North Carolina, the first American battleship to be commissioned in 18 years. The largest, most modern of all American warships. It has taken nearly eight years to design and build her. The North Carolina would soon be in the thick of battle. But on this day, the majority of her crew lie on the decks to see the damage kept secret for seven months. Larry Resin was a 17-year-old seaman aboard the North Carolina. I looked out and I saw these ships with their broken backs. I saw the Arizona still tilted over. The USS Oklahoma battleship, just the bottom showing oil all over the place. All of a sudden, there was this cheer from the men on the ships, from the shore, and I said to myself, we haven't done a thing, a damn thing, and they're cheering us. Ken Dews was at Pearl Harbor when the North Carolina came down the channel. What I saw there that day was the most magnificent man of war that any of us had ever seen. This ship meant that we had people, ships, and ammunition coming out of the states that were going to be there in short order and they were going to help us survive. The North Carolina would fight in every major campaign from Guadalcanal to the bombardment of Japan. She first saw action on 24 August 1942 while protecting the carrier Enterprise. was remarkable, since at the time she had none of the 40 millimeter anti-aircraft guns with which she would later be equipped. 
At one point, six dive bombers were driven off by her primitive 20-millimeter deck guns. And by day's end, she had shot down seven planes and assisted with seven more. In 1942, the North Carolina was a symbol of America's new strength in the Pacific. She would soon be joined by six of the eight battleships the Japanese thought they had destroyed at Pearl Harbor. At Guadalcanal, the carriers Enterprise, Saratoga, and Wasp were joined by the North Carolina, Washington, and South Dakota. Roosevelt Flinard served aboard the North Carolina. August 7th, 8th and 9th, 1942, the North Carolina was a part of a task force that was invaded Guadalcanal. We began firing uh, before daybreak, and we fired several hours after we, we bombarded the island a while, then the planes came in for bombardment, we backed out. The American carrier-based aircraft made certain that the Japanese would not reinforce their positions on the island. Our job in the magazine was to get powder and shells up to the gun. We were sealed in. We were three or four decks down in this magazine. We would have to really work hard when it was a air attack because uh, the five inch guns were shooting bam 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 real fast and we just had to get the part of that to them the men shut up in the north carolina and in other battleships during an air attack could track the japanese planes coming closer and closer by listening to the guns first the five inch then the more rapid 40 millimeter and finally the deck mounted 20 millimeter as the planes that survived came within close range Today, she rests as a state memorial in Wilmington, honoring the more than 10,000 North Carolinians who fought and died in World War II. To the USS a visit aboard the North Carolina is a visit back in time. Here, some 2,500 men once lived and worked and carried on the business of war in a city at sea. The North Carolina's engines could drive the ship at 27 knots, six knots faster than any previous American battleship. Here rest the nine great guns of her main battery, fired 2,396 times in nine operations by crews that often worked around the clock in the suffocating heat of the Pacific. Captain Dave Shoy is executive director of the North Carolina Memorial. He explains how the crew worked the guns. This is the lower projectile flat from where the crew would take the chosen type of ammunition, be it the 2,700-pound armor piercing or the 1,900-pound high-capacity projectile, and raise it up to the gun house to be placed in the barrel. Each steel barrel weighs 96 tons and can be loaded in 30 seconds. The first projectile is already in place to be raised up to the gun house. Once this projectile is clear, the next projectile is slid into place. A full nine gun broadside of armor piercing projectiles delivers a total weight of 24,000 pounds and can penetrate more than 20 inches of the strongest hardened steel. For every projectile, it takes six 90 pound powder bags. The crews down here will take the bags out of the tanks, put them on the conveyor belt. From here, they're passed one at a time to the powder flat, and then six of them together are gonna to be raised up to the gun. 
The projectile, when the transfer tray lays down, is then rammed into the barrel. In the second phase, the first three bags of powder come out of the hoist and are separated, and then the second three bags are rolled into place. In the third phase, the six bags of powder would then be rammed into the barrel, the primer attached to the last powder bag, the breech closed, and the gun is ready to fire. The shells are hurtled over 2,000 feet per second as the gun recoils on itself, a distance of four feet. At a range of nearly 20 miles with the guns at maximum elevation, the trajectory is seven miles high and the projectile becomes an armor-piercing bomb. To hit a moving target from a ship which itself is moving, pitching, and rolling requires a complex system of fire control. Deep below deck is the North Carolina's plotting room and the ship's analog computers. These primitive yet rugged computers called range keepers and their electrical switchboards control the guns. A stream of information from directors high up in the superstructure is relayed into the controlling range keeper. The course and speed of the ship and of its target ship, wind direction and velocity, temperature of the powder and the air, type of projectile, time of flight, gun wear, velocity of the ocean current and more. The gun is aimed not at the target, but where the target will be when the projectile gets there. Linked to the controlling range keeper is a gyroscopically operated device called the stable vertical. The guns actually remain stable and can be aimed with great accuracy while the ship rolls and pitches beneath them. The five inch guns were controlled by the same kind of computers or range keepers as the 16 inch guns, but loading was a manual operation. Dave Shoy. The five inch gun uses a projectile and a single powder case as opposed to the 16 inch gun which uses a projectile and six powder bags. So it is simpler for the, the operators to load the mount. They will they lay the projectile and the powder bag in the tray and then ram the uh, two pieces into the barrel. It takes about 47 sailors to fully man a five inch mount. Today, visitors relive what it was like to serve aboard such a ship. In passageways and living spaces below the main deck, thousands of battleship sailors made their home in ships like the North Carolina. They slept and ate and worked and played and worked. The galley served up three meals a day and then some. There was a store and a post office. And on a battleship, there was ice cream at the soda fountain. There was a newspaper, a tailor and a cobbler, and always there were decks to polish. As night falls, the North Carolina looms large against the Wilmington skyline. Her great guns glow in the moonlight as she awaits yet another day to welcome her visitors, eager to know what it was once like aboard one of America's most decorated battleships. Although the North Carolina came home to stay, Others would soon return to the battle line in defense of freedom. Next in our list of greatest fighting ships, a heavyweight of World War II, a battleship that could take its punishment, give it back, and never took no for an answer. North Carolina class, battleship. Displacement, 44,800 tons. Propulsion. Quadruple steam turbines producing 121,000 horsepower. Speed, 27 knots. Range, 17,850 miles. Protection, maximum armor, 16 inches. Principal armament, nine 16 inch guns. Crew, 1,880. 
Launched on June 1, 1940, the USS Washington was the first of the new generation American battleships that called for better torpedo and deck armor, longer endurance, and gas protection. Twelve days later, its sister ship, the North Carolina, was launched. Together, these two ships became known as the North Carolina class. But throughout their design and building stage, there were constant changes, due in part to an international treaty that limited the size of their guns. The North Carolina, of course, was famous for having been designed as three quad 14-inch mounts with a little option to put 16-inch at the last moment because there was a clause in the treaty saying, well, if the Japanese don't play fair, you can go to 16-inch guns. And the North Carolina class's nine 16-inch guns were the answer. Firing a 2,700-pound shell, they had a range of nearly 37,000 yards. Initially coupled with 25-inch and 16-1-inch, they were formidable fighters. Those ships were very successful both in surface combat as early as 1942. Also, there had been enough foresight to put a fairly large anti-aircraft battery on, and they were very successful as carrier escorts and as well as doing the supporting Marines and in, in amphibious invasions. By August 1942, the North Carolina was in the thick of the Pacific battles off Guadalcanal and Tulagi. It was in late 1942 that the strength of her torpedo armor was demonstrated, when after being hit by the Japanese submarine I-19, she had a 30 by 18 foot hole torn out of her side. Despite taking on nearly a thousand tons of water, she managed to make Pearl Harbor for repairs. Meanwhile, the USS Washington went into action in the Arctic, covering the Icelandic convoys for the Allies. Finally, in late August 1942, the Washington was in the Pacific and demonstrated her firepower in the Battle of Savo Island when it took on the Japanese battlecruiser Kirishima. Using a mix of radar and optical fire control, the Washington in seven minutes fired 75 16-inch shells and hundreds of 5-inch, which left the Kirishima a burning and crippled wreck. You have to understand fire control. And the U.S. had, by the middle of the war, the best radar. It was so good that you could see your own shell splashes and then, oh, I missed, I'll move it in closer. The Washington had joined a very elite group of capital ships that have won a gunfight against others of their own kind. Over the next three years, there was hardly an action that the North Carolina class were not involved in. At as late as July 1945, the North Carolina was still covering carrier raids against mainland Japan. Fall 1942, the battle for Guadalcanal wears on. The Japanese send one of their most powerful battleships, the Kirishima, to bombard the American air base at Henderson Field. On the nights of 14 and 15 November, between Savo Island and Guadalcanal, the battleships Washington and South Dakota engage in a gun duel at point-blank range with the Japanese force. The South Dakota is severely damaged, and the four American destroyers accompanying the two battleships are disabled in 20 minutes. The destroyer Preston took several direct hits before she sank. Her combat cameraman, Robert Reed, was thrown into the water. For nearly three hours, he watched the action. It was a duel between the Washington and the Kirishima. The Kirishima was outgunned. Her 14 inches could not penetrate the Washington's steel armored belt. The 16 inches of the Washington did penetrate the 14 inch belt of the Kirishima and spelled her doom. She apparently burned and exploded until she finally went down, according to the battle reports, around 3 a.m. or 3.30 only miles away. The remains of the Japanese gunships maneuver into position. Their mission, blast the hell out of Henderson Field and cover the arrival of the surviving transports. In command of the enemy force is Vice Admiral Nobutake Kondo, born in Osaka, Japan in 1886. He's a longtime naval warrior and veteran tactician. He personally leads his forces into Iron Bottom Sound. But what the Japanese don't know is that Admiral Bull Halsey has just sent in Enterprise battle wagon escorts South Dakota and Washington to destroy any and all enemy warships that threaten Henderson Field. Commanding the battleship division is Rear Admiral Willis A. Lee. The Kentucky native is an Olympic marksman and a no-nonsense naval veteran with 38 years of service under his belt. 
With USS Washington as his flagship, he sets off from Enterprise and heads for Iron Bottom Sound on the hunt for the Imperial Fleet. Now, in the darkness of night, an enemy gunship force led by battle wagon Kirishima is about to pound the U.S. forces on the island with a massive barrage. But what the Japanese don't know is that Enterprise battleships South Dakota and USS Washington have just been sent to stop them dead in the water. From the bridge of the Washington, Admiral Lee sends a fighting message to the rest of the fleet. Stand aside. I am coming through. USS Washington is a North Carolina-class battleship right out of the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Overall length, 729 feet. Displacement, 35,000 tons. Her weaponry is nine 16-inch guns, 20 5-inch rifles, and more than a dozen automatic anti-aircraft guns. 12.15 a.m. Radar on Battleship Washington picks up the location of enemy warships east of the volcanic peak known as Savo Island. Ten miles away, Battleship Kirishima and an enemy fleet head right for Guadalcanal on their mission to hit the Marines. But the USS Washington has the Imperial battle wagons dead in sight. Washington's big 16-inch rifles open fire before the Japanese know what's hitting them. Her first victim takes a load of American lead as Washington roars out a storm of heavy fire that devastates the Imperial warship. In another clash of iron, Imperial and American vessels square off in a gruesome display of firepower. In less than three minutes, USS Washington hammers out an amazing 42 rounds from her main battery. Now she squares off with battleship Kirishima. The thunder of 14-inch and 16-inch rifles and cannons echoes across the sea as Washington mauls the battleship Kirishima with her broadsides. During that battle, it's interesting that you have a preponderance on each side of their preferred weapon of choice. The Americans bring much heavier gun power to the fight. Uh, the Japanese, for their part, bring much heavier torpedo firepower. And yet, in this particular fight, the Japanese are not able to make that advantage in torpedoes tell. From the coconut lined banks of Guadalcanal, Enterprise pilots and Marines can clearly see the blaze of the nighttime slaughter. It was 20 miles away, but it sounded like out just next door to your tent. The battleships having at each other. From where we were, we could see the flash of the big battleship cannons, the cruiser cannons, and the lesser ones down to five inch going off, and the, the Japs were shooting at us. It was a horrendous, horrendous battle. Battleship Kirishima is finished. Her hull and superstructure are torn by the American shells. With fires raging over her decks, the enemy crew is forced to abandon ship. USS Washington is the only American battleship to actually sink an enemy battleship in the Second World War. Now, she and South Dakota lay into Japanese cruisers and destroyers, firing rapid broadsides from 16-inch and 5-inch guns. Two hundred and forty-two Americans and two hundred and forty-nine Japanese are killed. And the following day, battleship Kirishima is scuttled. She joins her sister Hiei in a watery grave in the depths of Iron Bottom Sound. The Americans have stopped the enemy gunships cold. 
The surviving Japanese cruisers and destroyers beat a hasty retreat north. Admiral Willis A. Lee pulls out of Iron Bottom Sound with a victory and will later receive the Navy Cross. Though South Dakota has been badly damaged, USS Washington is unhurt. The Enterprise's battle wagon has survived her first brush with the enemy fleet without a single fatality. And that's all folks for this episode about the North Carolina class battleships. Hope you enjoyed it. If you like what I'm doing, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel as I'll be uploading more videos about ships and ship classes in the upcoming days and weeks. Anyways, I'm going to leave you with some screenshots of the North Carolina in-game as I and I think many others would be eagerly anticipating getting our hands on it. Anyways, you all take care, have a wonderful day, and see you all on the high seas.